Amen. I have a little bit of, I say, I guess good news for you, maybe a little bit of bad news for you. Yesterday, uh, Brother Karen Childs and I went out and got on the golf course yesterday, had ourselves a wonderful time, outstanding time, great time. We had our good shots, didn't we? I mean, Aaron hit a couple of shots. Good shots and some man. really great shots. I was just been very pleased. And good news is that uh, we have been contacted by the PGA. <laughs> uh, the bad news is we're going on tour and we won't be around for a while. So. Wait a minute. Y'all might think it's the other way around. Y'all may think the good news is that we're not. Or at least I'm not going to be here for a while. But, depends on uh, how people take calls. Yeah, I guess so, Aaron. We, Aaron and I had an awesome time out there yesterday. Beautiful weather, just like today. Not a cloud in the sky. And uh, we played and just enjoyed ourselves so, so very much. We started a series last week called Journey to the Center of the Soul. And I told you it would be a little bit of a mini-series because as I came back from New York City, counted up a number of weeks as we lead into... Uh, Easter and Easter Sunday and tried to look and see what exactly happened and what transpired in the life of Jesus in that last period of time. And we know it's a journey and we know Jesus was on a journey. I'm not sure how much we understand and realize and know that Je Jesus was on a journey to the center of our soul. I mean the journey that Jesus was on was leading to correct the problem with mankind and God the big gap that was in between, and he would fill that gap, and now the relationship between God and man could be rectified. So he was on his way through the journey. Through everything he went through from that period of time, he was on his way to the journey to the center of our souls and the recapture of our souls. In the introduction and overview in a few moments, I will take up a little bit of time and go back and talk a little bit about last week because I think it's very important that we understand all the context of what happened and transpired last week as we move into this week. The title for this week is Anointing and Pointing. Now my early education background is in music education. Most of you know that. Uh, in, high, in high school I was under some what I would consider as the most outstanding conductors in high school. Mike Spears was our band director, Dr. Lloyd L. Higgins was our choir director, and these were two of the five musicians, even to this day, that I know. They were just very, very incredible. Two wonderful conductors, but one of the things about these conductors, and if you've ever been in a choir and band before, is they were extremely critical. Very, very critical. To the point that when the band or choir would start and, and sing for just a little ways or do something, it didn't take very long for them to stop and to fix and to correct things. And some of that must have rubbed off on me because I always had the, the uh, reputation as a choir director as, as, as only getting one or two measures and then we stop and we would fix the problem and complication. In fact, at first, Needle and some of them will remember and some of the choir members still remember when I first went there, we'd go all the way through a song. Then we would go back and we'd start practicing the song. And about a measure or two inches, I'd stop. And they'd begin to think, are we ever going to go all the way back to the song? And I would stop to, to criticize or to correct or to point out a situation or an issue that was going on that needed to be fixed. So today, for just a second, to kind of get you in this ideal of pointing and pointing out, so we're talking about anointing and we're talking about pointing, we're going to do something just a little different for a second. We're going to pretend that we're a choir. How many of you have ever been in a choir before? Okay. How many of you have been in a band before? Okay, we have a lot of musicians here. Alright, so next week I expect all 35, 40 of you to be in the praise team. And if there's nobody out here, that's okay. Well, that's good. So we're going to pretend we're in a choir. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Are you ready? Everybody ready to go? Alright, here we go. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. Sit up. If I sit up, then talk. Right? 
Can you open your mouth? Let me go with it. Amazing grace. Oh, you're not using your doctrine. Okay, you need to talk about your doctrine. Okay, go back and do it again. Amazing grace. You're not opening your mouth, okay? You have to, if you're going to sing, you're going to have to open your mouth. You get the idea. Kind of critical, but but trying to fix the problem and point out the situation and what's happening. You get the idea. Like my mentors, I point out every musical problem in hand. That's what I did. Matter of fact, Cindy told me one time, after we've been married for a couple years, she'd been in choir, she said, you know what? I get frustrated now when I hear somebody sing. And I said, why is that? She said, I used to just listen to them, but now I listen to them critically because of all the things that you said. Pointing out and looking at things that, that are situations and problems, that's just what I learned to do in high school and college. Now, one of the things I will say about my band director and choir director, as critical as they were, and as much as they could point out all the problems when we got to the festivals and all, we were always one of the best bands and choirs there because they fixed the problem and they pointed out the problem. Today's title is reflective of the scripture. Anointing or pointing. Someone in the verse of Scripture is anointing Jesus. And I want you to be ready to know and to understand and think about who this is. Someone in this verse of Scripture is anointing Jesus. And someone in this point of this verse of Scripture is pointing out all the problems with the anointing. Let's read John 12, 1 through 8. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Father, may you not only read the blessing of your word, or bless the reading of your word, Father, may you help us today to realize that there is application found in your word every time we read it, every time it's presented to us, and may we apply it to our hearts and lives. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I talked a few minutes ago about the introduction. Quite a bit of information in the introduction today, and I promise you after the introduction, for some reason, there's two points. So there's a long introduction, or at least an introduction to set the context and make sure our minds are heading the right direction. Because remember I talked about that last week we examined the situation concerning the healing of Lazarus. That's what we talked about. And many people, if you remember, had come to console Mary and Martha prior to Jesus resurrecting him. So there were a lot of people around when Jesus got there to resurrect, or to when he first got there, and then he resurrected Lazarus. And after the resurrection, some believed, remember? And some became followers. They believed and they said, we see what's happening going on. We believe that Jesus, you are the Son of God, and we will follow you. Some did that. Last week we realized that some did not believe, and remember what we said they became? Tattletale. And we talked about tattletales a little bit. Because the ones who did not believe, what did they do? They ran to the religious leaders. And they said, oh, by the way, I'm tugging on, I guess, the robes. Do you know what Jesus is over here doing? And so some of the ones who did not believe became tattletales. And then the religious leaders realized something. They were in a pickle. How many of y'all know understand what that means? I mean, I'm, is that a Louisiana term when you're in a pickle? Okay, I want to make sure. They, the religious leaders realized that they were in a pickle. Why were they in a pickle? Because they had gone to Jesus and said, Look, prove who you are to us. You say that you are the Son of God, but prove it. Jesus proved it. And now, He's becoming popular and they're losing their popularity they're in a pickle. They ask Jesus to do something, and He does it, and it backfires on them. And then the, pot of the, the, uh, the 
forthcoming time after that they begin to realize is this thing is blowing up in their face, that there is a good possibility that they're even going to lose their positions because of the popularity of Jesus. And so their narcissistic side becomes out and they begin to get selfish. And of course their being selfish leads to Jesus going from being a healer and a teacher to now he's a criminal. Because these guys said, well, it didn't work to tell him to go prove who he is. And he went out and did that, and now he's becoming more popular. That didn't work. So then they looked and they said, we've got to do something else. And of course, the whole idea then is brought up. And now the journey is really beginning with Jesus. He is now on his way to the journey to the center of the soul. Because now they're labeling him a criminal. Now the journey is going to lead to his arrest, and his beating, and his crucifixion and the resurrection. So now you get the picture. Now you see where we are. You see what happened last week with what happened with Lazarus and what on. And that brings us to where we are right now. And the house is filled with people. The disciples are there. Some close friends are there. And Jesus is there. It was a clandestine meeting. See, Jesus is now a wanted man. There's Jesus who everybody was looking to for their healing and for their teaching and, and was gathering all around. Now things have changed and they turn. This is Jesus now and He's at one of the homes of one of His friends because now He's a wanted man. A man with a price on His head. Jesus was no longer appearing in public. He was hiding out in different rural towns with some of the disciples. And you may think, well, hmm, maybe that's out of fear. Maybe... Because of now he knows what's happening. The words got to him that, hey, you're now labeled as a criminal. That maybe he had some fear. He said, well, I have to go to these people's house and get out of the public because of fear. It wasn't because of fear. Why was it? Because of time. Time wasn't right. He was going to be the Passover lamb. So it was not time. So Jesus wasn't in hiding or wasn't at this friend's house in hiding because of fear. He was there because the time just wasn't right. According to Mark's account, Jesus is in the home of one of the newest disciples, Simon, who was a former leper who had been healed by Jesus. Now, I love this part. He had to stay with him. Got the idea. Lazarus has been resurrected. Now Jesus is a criminal. He's a wanted man. He's in the house of Simon, a former leper who had been healed by Jesus. Now, get this. this is, I love this. What a great place to hide. Got the idea? In the home of a leper, there was no way any of the scribes or Pharisees were going to come looking for him, were they? And why? They'd be concerned about being unclean. Come near this house would leave them ceremonially unclean for a long time. I love that. How many of you remember Corrie Ten Boom? You have to read the book or remember the story that uh, her book, The Hiding Place, she describes how she and her family were locked in a Nazi concentration camp because they had helped many of the Jews escape. I mean, that was the story of Corey of Cory Ten Boom. And in that life, I mean, the, in that book that she describes, it was just a horrible, horrible life. Their conditions, their living conditions were, were very, very horrible. One of the things that they had to endure in their conditions was, was lots. Now, lice can be a bad thing. I mean, it can be a very uncomfortable thing. And they had to deal with that, and they had to live with it. But she realized later how much a blessing having lice was. Why was it? Soldiers wouldn't come in to where they were. They could sit there and have their Bible studies. Because the soldiers weren't about to come into that place. Same thing happened with Jesus. Because of Simon's former disease and people's fear, Jesus had safety from his pursuers. A crowd of people gathered that night. They gathered for one reason, to have a dinner in honor of Jesus. This was the night before Jesus' triumphant entry, the night before Jesus would ride in Jerusalem on a donkey to the praises of the shouts of multitudes. Do you have the picture? Do you have the picture in your mind? you see where we are? you see what's happening? What's going on? Now in these verses of Scripture, let's consider for a few minutes anointing. And let's consider pointing. Let's go back to that verse of Scripture where it said that Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped His feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Martha, if you remember, is serving. Okay? Remember we got the picture? Martha's over serving. What's Lazarus doing? He's reclining. And most likely, there's a lot of discussion going on about Jesus' accomplishments. They're now kind of in hiding, so to speak. So they're probably reflecting a little bit. They're talking about Jesus' accomplishments, His healings, and, and then the resurrection that they had just seen. And 
Then Mary is moved to do something that is considered wrong by everyone but her and Jesus. She's moved to anoint Jesus with the dawn. Expensive perfume. And you need to understand the significance of nard. Think about this. This isn't, guys, this is probably more for us. Nard, okay? This isn't some cheap perfume that you pick up at the dollar store on your way home when you've forgotten that birthday or anniversary. That's not what nard was. Nard was a highly prized perfume imported from the Himalayan region of India. And the actual amount in the Greek text is 300 denarii, which a denarius was a small silver coin and often used in the Roman world as a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. Let's put it in, in this kind of terms right here. Jesus' complaint is that Mary just wasted, in our terms, fifteen to $20,000 worth of nard. That's in our terms. Got the idea. Now, you weren't Mary, and you were sitting there, and you saw what was going on. You'd have to be pretty honest and probably think, Oh, $15,000 to $20,000 of stuff. See, <clears throat> there was this uh, past year in the fall, and he said, uh, for Christmas, uh, there's a certain perfume that I'd like to have. Well, it turned out that this certain perfume that Cindy liked to have was out of production. But she asked for it for that Christmas. Christmas. Candace and Freeman, they worked diligently, and they got online and trying to see if, even though it's out of production, maybe there's still some left around, you know, not too much. Uh, or something to be found, and they did. They found it online. And it must have been something close and near to Dar because it cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars by today's standards. <laughs> I was just seeing Dar what <laughs> I did for fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. And our house is for sale. <laughs> Obviously I did. I love her and I did purchase it, but it wasn't that much. But you get the idea of the dark. You understand? Got a picture? So the picture we get of Mary here is, in this scripture is a devoted disciple who ignores the taboos of her society and her commitment to Jesus. Because sitting at his feet as a disciple was not the place for a woman. But she did it anyway. Commended. And she was committed by Jesus. Then she acts in even more of a scandalous manner and anointing Jesus' feet with extremely expensive perfume and then wiping uh, the feet with her hair. You see how totally out of context this is? Think about this. Mary is going against the custom of her society. She's drawing the ur of the people present by using the most expensive perfume to anoint Jesus. And why? Because she followed her heart. Her heart told her why. Anoint Jesus. Mary had a whatever it takes to give my best to Jesus attitude. Most of us don't even think about giving to Jesus. I mean, most of us, what we have set up in our prayer life is when we go to Jesus, it's, Jesus, what can you give to me? I'm coming to you today, Jesus, and I have some things here, and i got a list, checking them off, or checking twice, going to find out if I've been naughty or nice, I guess. Because, Jesus, I have a list. And I want to see what you're going to give to me today, Jesus. Instead of going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, what can I give to you? Most of us, our prayers the other way around. With Mary that day, it was Jesus. I want to give to you. And I'm not just going to give. I'm going to give the best I possibly can. I close this particular point. I want to give a little bit of a story. Those of you, how many of you have been to the Rockies or Colorado Mountains and all this stuff? You'll picture some of this. It's been a very, very hard winter in the Rockies. And uh, the Red Cross was out. And they were dropping off food <coughs> supplies to different people. And people, uh, there was so much snow. Couldn't, some of them couldn't get in and out of there houses of the Red Cross and the men were doing what they needed to to help the people and take care of the people. It was just a very, very hard, hard winter. These men thought they were just about through uh, providing for the people in this particular reason. So they get on a helicopter and they're up in the air and they're fixing to go and get back home. And all of a sudden they look down and they see a cabin down there. And I mean just almost totally uh, banked in with snow, but there was a stream of smoke coming out. And so they knew someone's in. But their first thought was, Somebody's there, but boy, they have to be in need. I mean, they have to be in bad need. They, they're, they're blocked on the snow, may not even be able to get out. So they finally find a clearing, and it's about a mile off from the house. So they sit down over there, and they put all their packs and their backpacks and all the stuff. And man, they trudge and they go through the snow and a mile down from, from where they land. And they finally get to the hole, and they get there, and they mark it all the snow and everything off of the thing, and they knock on the door, and this little old lady comes to the door. And they said, ma'am, we're here from the Red Cross. 
and she said, Honey, it's been a long, hard winter, and I just don't think we have anything we can give this year. <laughs> but most people open their door, what are they thinking? What do you have for me? What are you going to give to me? It's all about me. I'm in need, and you need to do something for me. She opens the door and just apologizes. No, I, honey, I just don't have anything to give to Red Cross. Mary, Mary was willing to give. Mary was willing to give her best to Jesus. She followed her heart, broke the rules, and made everyone upset. She anointed Jesus with expensive perfume, which led the disciples, Judas in particular, to respond to this man. It's such a waste. Well, that leads us to point. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, left Jacob. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared. You notice that? I mean, he wasn't saying this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, Judas' shock at the waste of such costly anointment makes us more aware of Mary's extravagance and what she was doing. But it also makes us aware of what? Judas' narcissism, just like we talked about last week. The selfishness there, because he knew if the money was not there, if perfume wasn't sold to put in, he wouldn't have as much to take. It also makes us aware of, of the other religious leaders who were there. and They're looking out for number one. They were more concerned about losing money, and, and he was more concerned about the money that wouldn't be there for him to steal. and, and instead of taking care of Jesus and realizing that Jesus is in the house. How many times do we not realize that Jesus is in the house? But they're now coming to a point that they're realizing that what has happened here, they're not even paying attention so much that they're with Jesus who's just performed the resurrection and all the things, what are they concerned about? Not the money. So Judas begins this. Judas begins the pointing. He states what, what the others are thinking. So Jesus is kind of a spokesman. He begins to point to Mary, and he begins to point out her faults. And he's beginning to point out how wrong it is to use perfume for anointing the king of kings. Can you imagine that she's doing something good for Jesus, and now Judas is beginning to point out the things she's doing wrong? He's pointing out the wrong of using this perfume that represents money to ceremonially prepare Jesus' body for burial. That's what she was doing, and that's what Jesus knew she was doing. My time is, is, is at hand. And I soon will be buried. And Jesus is saying to them that, that this perfume is being used in preparation for my burial. Do you think they were missing the point as they pointed out the, the faults or the complications of the problems that were going on? See, I think this verse of Scripture, and I, I want you to listen very carefully. This will close out this point, but I want you to listen. I think this verse of Scripture begs us to look inward and evaluate our thought perspective in regards to our Christian law. Why would that be, Carl? Why would you say that? What response do the disciples give to Mary's action of knowing Jesus? They begin to point their fingers at her. They begin to analyze her actions. They begin to criticize the actions of her devotion and praise to Jesus. And how many times in church are we more concerned with our horizontal relationships than we are with our vertical relationships. How many times are we more in tune with seeing the wrong actions of our fellow Christians and pointing out their faults and coming to church with a desire to be in the presence of, our, of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and anoint Him? Now think about it. Think about it when you got up this morning. Think about it when you come to church next week. That's all Hey, number one thing, I can't wait to get there. I'm going to be in the presence of God, all my Jesus Christ, my Lord, and I'm going to anoint Him with my praise. I just, I can't stand it. I'm going to drive 150 miles an hour. If I get stopped, that's okay, but I can't wait to get there. I'm going to Jesus. And we get up, other things are on our mind. We get here, we get to look around, we see other, we see what we're doing, how we're doing. Maybe our attention is drawn to this type of relationship in such a strong way that even sometimes we become critical and say, look at old so-and-so over there. Look at this person. Look at them. Look at how they're doing. I can't believe they're running that mission. Instead of anointing, we don't point. 
Mary was anointing him. She was anointing Jesus. Judas and the other disciples were pointing. They were pointing at Mary, more concerned about uh, the thought of the indiscretion of what they were doing instead of fostering their relationship with Jesus. I'm going to close with this here. And this is, I love this. Then Jesus speaks and he clears the water. <laughs> Sometimes maybe when, when things are going a little like this, you know, and things are happening, maybe we just need to stop saying, Jesus, speak. <laughs> Clear the water for us, okay? So you understand the situation. Mary's doing her thing. They're over here pointing out the forest, and Jesus speaks and he says this. Believe her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. Now, as I look at this whole passage, this is one of those that can almost seem to be a, a contradiction or, or a passage that leads to a little bit of confusion from this standpoint. Because we may question, we say, isn't the overwhelming thing of, theme of Jesus to help those who can't help themselves and to help the poor and the down and out? Isn't that the overall arching thing? Isn't that what He did every day when He got up? Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what He taught us to do? Is it a little bit confusing now? But isn't that what He taught us to do? Yes, it is what He taught us to do. Isn't it a little confusing? Then why is Jesus allowing expensive perfume to his poor? When it's sold, the money could be used to feed the poor. Great question that begs an explanation. Jesus, of course, gave the explanation. Here it is. First thing first. How simple is it? First thing first. Basically, what Jesus was saying is let's have our priorities. See, you always have to think context. What Jesus said in this context, when He said, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. It must be understood in His context because within Judaism, in Judaism, a burial really received higher priority than charity work. So when you put that in context, it's not, Jesus is not even wrong at this point. They may not understand. The disciples, they, some of them haven't grasped the idea that Jesus is not going to be along with them much longer. And his burial and his death and all this things going to happen is very soon. It's going to happen. And so what Mary was doing was actually what the, the, the custom of the Jews was. And that was that burial was even more important than charity. Now Jesus was prepared for his burial. His time was coming. I look at it this way. Worshiping the Lord is priority one. Amen? Worshiping the Lord is priority one. When we have the right relationship to Jesus and He has the right place in our hearts, our actions will follow. Amen? First things first. Make sure your relationship to Jesus is where it needs to be and your desire to help others will soar to the top. It, it will just, you can't hold it in. If you get your relationship to with Jesus right and where it needs to be, then your desire to help others is just going to come flowing out of you. You can't help but flow out because you're going to be full of Jesus. And what would Jesus do? One way to serve so See, many people do acts of kindness. Well, what, what makes Christians different? I mean, you think about it. All kinds, there are people out there with lots and lots and lots of money and they're doing good things, right? Or so and so, oh, they get a bunch of money this year, and all that type of thing. Many people do acts of kindness, but what makes Christians different is we do them in the name of Jesus. And He receives the honor and the glory, not us. Understand? First thing is Christ. Strong relationship with Jesus Christ is going to lead to us to want to give, and when we do, we turn back around and say, oh, it's I don't know if that excites anybody else, but that's me. We'll close with one more little true story. How many of you remember the days of bus ministries? Great days in the life of churches. Many, many students, children started on the bus ministry, came to church, accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Many moms and dads eventually followed and came to the church, accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Bus ministries. Tremendous. Uh, part of church life at some point in time. 
I guess back in the days when there was bus ministry, a bus captain, and if you remember, I worked bus ministry in one of the little churches I was in a few years ago. Your duty was on Saturdays, you pretty much went door to door. And you were given a certain area, and you said, this is where your bus is going to run. So you go to the door, and you knock on the door. And then you see kids in the house, you say, hey, I'm here as the captain of my bus ministry or whatever, and I, I won't pick your child up. So this one particular bus captain is out, and he's doing his thing, and he's knocking on the door. And he looks up, and all of a sudden, about, I think a nine-year-old boy shows up at the door, greets him. Turns out this nine-year-old boy has been left with his little brother to take care of him while the parents are off doing something else. Bus driver says, uh, young man, would you like to come to church with me? The little boy looks at him and says, I've never been to church. So the bus driver said, well, I would like to pick you up, and I'd like to come and get you, but first, would you mind if I just share a little bit about Jesus with you? Or voices, I don't know anything about church. I don't really know much about Jesus. The bus captain goes in, sits down with his nine-year-old boy, and shares Jesus. And the nine-year-old boy accepts Christ right there. In the and the bus driver says, now, tomorrow I'm going to be here. I'm going to pick you up. The boy says, oh, I'm excited. That's great. I, I can't wait. New life in Christ. Bus driver gets there the next day, picks up this nine-year-old boy, maybe his little brother. They come to church. They're sitting in church. It comes time for the offering time. So the men go pick up their wooden offering plates. And they start passing those offering plates by. The little boy's never been to church, and he's just accepted Jesus. And he's sitting there and he's thinking, I'm trying to figure this out. All of a sudden, kind of, oh, okay. They're passing the plates, and you're supposed to put some money in it. So he's kind of getting the idea of it. And I mean, the little boy is so excited about the new free gift he got from Jesus, and he's down in his pockets and he's trying to see it. All of a sudden, he realizes, I don't have any money. Hey, plate passes away. He's sitting there and he's watching, seeing the plate going back. He gets about six or seven rows back there, and, and finally, he just all he could take because he wanted to give something back to Jesus. And so he gets up out of his seat. You can imagine how people are probably like, oh, here's this new kid in here, he's out of his seat. He walks, he gets out of the seat, he walks several rows back. And he gets back to the place of passing the off the plate. He tugs on the man looks down the boys there and he says, Sir, can I have that off the plate for a second? And the man said, Yes, sir. You can have the off the plate. And the kid takes the off the plate, puts it down the road, and steps in. He said, I didn't have anything else to give the kids to get the seat. Mary said, I have expensive perfume that's the best that I possibly have. And I'm going to give it to Jesus, of course, in the process of forgiving. Many pointed that she's anointing, pointing out the faults. <clears throat> Jesus wants us, He wants our best given to Him. And then He wants us in turn to give to others. When we're right with Jesus. We're anointing Him. We won't be pointing at others. And we'll be ministering to Him. That's right. Right with Jesus, we'll be anointing Him. That Sunday you just can't wait to get Him. Because you will think, that's what I'm going to have to church. It's to anoint Him to praise Him. Not to come down and to Him. Are you anointing all of you? Father, we come before you today. We love you so much. We always thank you for your verse of Scripture. Father, I pray that anything that's been said or done in the verse of Scripture is from you and not from me. And God, you can take your word today and anoint us in such a way that we can hear your heart and do the Lord. Father, I pray that all of us can examine our lives and, and realize that we've given our best to Jesus. Everything that we possibly can give to you. To the example that Mary shows us. Our relationships, is it more important that we have a vertical relationship with you than the horizontal relationships that we have with you? And we do first thing first. How that relationship with you right where it needs to be and everything else will follow. We have so much desire to help you. So I pray for anyone who's here, and there may be someone here today that says, I've never made that first step. Like that boy in the story, I, I've never accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. If there's anyone here today that's never accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, God, I'm grateful. This is the time of their salvation. They can come to the front and 
God, we can talk and we can share, and I'll share Jesus with them next step, Jesus Christ, today. Okay. Father, for those of us that are here, have to take this verse of Scripture, let it permeate our heart, help us to examine. Are we anointing? Is that who we are? Are we pointing? Help us to be Mary's and be like her. Be someone that's reaching out to Jesus and in the presence of Jesus in front And Father, help us to have that strong, strong desire as you fill us with who you are. To love one another in our horizontal relationship, but also God to have the desire to help you and to reach out to you. God, I just pray for our time of communion for anyone who wants to come for a few moments as we get close, especially to Easter. You know, our hearts just continue to draw closer to the one of the one. Thank you. As we continue to talk about how your journey is beginning to the center of the soul, help us to realize every Sunday what this entails in your life. Help us to Thank you for everything that you've done for us. This is your invitation time. We turn it over to you. Let's be precious holy. Let's stand together.